Okay, hello everybody. I'm Jan Hendrik Heermann. I did my PhD in 2006 until 2010 uh, at this institute. Uh, and after this, uh, I went to different places, um, including Canada, the US, and now I work in Bremen, uh, Germany. Mm, I would like to put my timer here. Okay, but I will look at this. I'm a little bit afraid to cut into your lunch. <laughs> I won't tell you that. Then I'm to okay. So, uh, what I will tell you today is an idea. Uh, I don't know if it is really like this. Um, it could be different. Um, most of the time of my life, I have no idea uh, about what is right or what is wrong. At least this is how I feel. Like really, in the past, I had a lot of anxiety. I still have this. And um, like, I think feeling lost is kind of normal. Like, and what I would like to say is during the three years in Roscoff, um, I didn't feel like this. <laughs> when I look back to that three years, um, I see much more light. Um, I was much more confident, um, and I felt really, really good uh, because of you. Um, and <laughs> it's really true. I felt so good that even though, even though, um, so this kind of anxiety comes from many things, like not knowing, always making mistakes all the time, like uh, self-doubt, all these kind of things, right? And uh, when I came here, uh, I felt so welcome. And this comes from every corner, like uh, Frank in the restaurant says Jan Hendrik to me. <laughs> like he says Jan Hendrik. Today, yesterday. And... Uh, like, in my PhD, we did this discovery together in the group in nature. And I would have never, I always wanted some big discovery, but I was not able to do something. I had not enough network to do a hypothesis. And because I was too young. And I kind of, it had to be a discovery because I didn't believe in my capabilities. Like, if you have heavy capabilities, you can do big projects. But if you do not believe, you have only, you have only discovery. And uh, here with Miriam, Gervan, Tristan, Gail Korek, William Helbert, and all the others together, I had enough confidence uh, to do this discovery and to push it forward. And it wouldn't have been possible without you. I can give you one example. Uh, this discovery is um, that we discovered that uh, a uh, genes from marine bacteria were by horizontal gene transfer transferred uh, to the gut bacteria of Japanese people. A transfer from the ocean to the, to the human gut is a real discovery and it contained um, things like biochemistry, and I learned here confidence from Miriam to trust the data. And then it contained uh, evolution, and I learned the confidence to trust this data from Gilvan Michel. And from Gail Correct and William Helbert, I, I learned the confidence to trust this data uh, because they have the chemistry mind. And, um, and Tristan by Byron was critical because at lunch, uh, when we saw this phylogenetic tree uh, with Gervan, and there were some kind of bacteria, and I had no idea what these names were, Tristan said, well, Jan Hendrik, look at this. These are human gut bacteria. Would he have not said this? Like, there would have been no discovery. And so, um, this is what I want to say. I want to say, <laughs> I want to say, that this space, the Station Biologique, 
allowed me to be so confident to push something like this forward. And I pushed it into that journal. This is what I did. And I could not have done it otherwise, or somewhere else. Today, I will give you an idea um, um, about glycans. I think glycans are the key uh, to carbon sequestration. Uh, I think they are really important for the future. And I will tell you why. Glycans, if you don't know, are polymers of sugars made by and covering all organisms on Earth. Uh, the green, brown, and red ones make most of them. You have glycans in your skin on every cell. The cancer cell of the mutulus, maybe it is so strong because it has the bigger glycan layer. Uh, the sponge is full of glycan, full. Here's a model glycan I will be talking about, but it is only one of many. I will tell you today about a precedent, only with one but extrapolate to every glycan on every surface. This is Fucoidin. It is a glycan made in massive amounts by all these brown ones you see out there. Also, the microalgae make them in massive amounts. The thing I thought about since I'm 16 and I thought the misery of nature, which I love the most, including animals and plants, is this. This is the real problem. Since about 200 years, we put so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that uh, the, regular, um, the regular cycle of up and down uh, goes totally out of the roof. And uh, I find this really stressful. And I think about who could fix this. And I think we cannot fix this. Seriously, I don't think we can fix this. Like, uh, and this has to do with physics. Primary production, that is photosynthesis, um, makes 100 gigatons of carbon into uh, carbon, carbon from carbon dioxide into biomass per year. And you can directly translate this into energy because uh, it's, it's light, essentially. So they make light into carbon, the brown, green, and uh, the, the red. When you have this carbon at every next level that extracts carbon from that first level, you have 90% loss. It just disappears. That is the thing with the pyramid, the food pyramid. For one kilo of meat that I make, I need to eat 10 kilo of grain. And 9 kilo of grain or 9 kilo of grain and carbon goes away. So we conserve only one-tenth of the energy. We emit so much carbon into the atmosphere. When you put these numbers together, you can come to no other conclusion uh, mathematically. I see no other way. Maybe you, you know it. I don't know that, there's, that plants and algae have 10 times more energy and power than all other organisms combined, including humans, bacteria, and everyone else. So if we only talk about energy, everything else, including us, is 10 times less important. So we cannot fix it. Only algae and plants can fix it. From a planetary scale, I have no other way to think about it. We, the first thing we would do if we went to Mars is put plants there. We wouldn't put some kind of nuclear facility to, to make the atmosphere. Let's have another and so uh, glycans in the ocean carbon cycle, I think, are important. They are made by algae. They make glycans. Uh, bacteria reconvert into CO2. I think if we want more carbon sequestration, we need more um, of uh, production. And we, we need more of this and less of this and more of this. And why could this go uh, work? I see already signs that it works because in every big carbon pool, we look in the biosphere, there is these massive amounts of glycans. In marine dissolved organic carbon, which has as much carbon as the atmosphere, CO2, 15 to 50% glycans. In sediment, up to 18%. In soils, up to 14%. In algae, 40%. In terrestrial plants, 70%. When there is so much glycan, it is difficult for me to understand why everybody around me tells me that bacteria love this material that apparently 
accumulates massively in the environment. So why do I read everywhere that glycans are prebiotics and food for bacteria? I don't understand this if there's massive accumulation. I don't understand. Um, Oh, yeah. um, so I don't understand it because one, the example from my PhD, which showed it is so easy for bacteria to acquire genes to degrade glycans. So when horizontal gene transfer also shown during my postdoc, here this is all the horizontal gene transfers in bacteria uh, to degrade a glycan. If this is so easy all the time, then why, why do they not evolve so fast and just break it all down and emit the CO2 into the atmosphere? What's the problem for the bacteria? We know they evolve so fast, like in tubes. Uh, after one week is a new bacterium there, different to the one one week before. Uh, I, I don't get it. <laughs> and so this is here. Again, this is amount of carbon in form of organic mo molecules in the ocean, amount of carbon in the atmosphere, approximately 30% uh, in form of these glycans. Very young, produced in massive amounts by algae and injected into the ocean to not be eaten. So, and my question is, why do bacteria not inject all this carbon and degrade it by horizontal gene transfer and evolve so fast and, and move it out? And I think, what if there is an unknown barrier that holds back bacteria, fungi, virus, and the ability to react organic carbon to carbon dioxide? This barrier is what we would need to, to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and what type of organism would have enough energy power to build a wall against bacterial respiration, and why would they do this in the first place? And we know that algae uh, make extracellular matrix glycans to form a barrier against being digested alive by prokaryotes. Uh, they make a phycosphere. It's full of long-chain glycans. Um, yeah. And the biological evolutionary function of this is to make a wall against bacterial invasion, respiration, degradation. It's a little bit philosophical at this moment, uh, but I, I think it could be. And not only algae do this, the microalgae on the left, the diatom, they do this, uh, and the human intestine, one liter, including our saliva of glycan, uh, injected all the time through the system, uh, to not be overcome by some horrible E. coli bacterium. Uh, in the middle, the, the, oh, I'm really, here, the roots of these trees uh, secrete a lot of that material. The corals and the sponges, they all do it. And it's difficult for bacteria to deal with it because uh, glycans have high structural complexity for each complex glycan with the amount of different numbers of linkages in their bacteria need an enzyme. And it's a real struggle for bacteria to, to evolve and deal with this. And you see this in this uh, linear relationship. So the more complicated a glycan, the more enzymes they need and the more barriers this is to degradation. And uh, sometimes we see these uh, strange things in bacteria. This is a bacterium degrading fucoidin. And this bacterium, this is its genome. It has hundreds of orange and blue enzymes for fucoidin degradation. And it's so many for different types of fucoidin, where now I actually start to think that this number doesn't scale with the amount of linkages. So it's too many for the linkages in the molecule. It doesn't make sense. Like, there's too many. And what if 
what if there's more than just structure complexity? What if these molecules are a chemical burden onto proteins? I have no data to support this, but I think this. So what are glycans? On the left here, you have a regular cell. You can take any cell. It works for, for eukaryotes. Uh, of if they are animals or if they are even maybe it works for bacterium. These are now algal cells. In the inside, you have the intracellular carbon. Uh, energy on top, proteins, DNA, RNA, lipids, ATP. This is about 50%. On the right side, you have uh, on the top the, what I call protective carbon. This is phenolic, saponins, uh, uh, benzoate, and sulfated fucan. In this example only, there are other types of secreted glycans, polysaccharides. The social carbon we know is small sugars, DMSP, mannitol. Uh, these are known molecules to support bacteria, so of course this can also happen, uh, even though I really don't think bacteria need support. Like, they are so fast, with 20-minute division time, uh, up to 20 minutes. I know they're also very slow ones, but at least the fast ones, they don't need support. They will always divide by themselves. There's nothing that theoretically holds them back. They're just theoretically overcoming us unless we create balance between the growth rates of the eukaryotic cell and the prokaryote, or any cells. Like, uh, it's just about uh, tuning maybe growth rates. So there is something maybe in this protective carbon that helps to tune growth rates of uh, other cells and at the same time could help for carbon sequestration because the activity uh, during the living time of these organisms, of the molecules, uh, proceeds even after these organisms die. And if I expand on this idea, uh, let's imagine the algal cell and the connection to Earth, uh, carbon dioxide levels in atmosphere, it's just an idea. In a time of uh, happiness, uh, you don't stress much. Bacteria are no threat. Uh, maybe even you need them and feed them to attract them so they bring you nitrogen and phosphate. And then maybe in times of average stress of the Earth system, uh, there is some kind of balance between protect carbon and social carbon. And then when we really crank up stress with temperature and high CO2, what if the plant cumulative biomass on Earth feels this and starts to protect themselves more, produces more of these molecules that store carbon in the biosphere? So what we see is in nature, with uh, Sylvia discovered this, um, the sulfated fucan during an algal bloom, sulfated fucan made by diatoms during three months algal bloom was, unlike other polysaccharides, not digested and just accumulated into particles. It went up. This is a sulfated fucan. Other ones that have other biological roles did not show that behavior. So not all polysaccharides do potentially such a thing, Laminarine is for energy. Of course, it is degraded, so we couldn't detect it. And it doesn't really accumulate, but the sulfated fucan, it was not used by bacteria. And this experiment we uh, reproduced uh, with colleagues um, in uh, Asaf Wadi's group um, in Bergen mesocosms, where during uh, 20 days, the sulfated fucan during the bloom went up, 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 up and bacteria showed no signs of removal. Um, and Sylvia again then showed in a marine sediment that the sulfated fucan, among many other polysaccharides I don't show you here, is in a marine sediment under 1,500 meter depths. And this is the depths where you need to get if you want to sequester carbon. 
uh, on average, you need to reach 1,000 meter. I would also at this moment thank uh, Ceci Hervé for making the fantastic antibodies that we use to enable this detection. Uh, it's a fantastic technology. Uh, without uh, your work, uh, none of these data I showed so far would have been possible. Now, um, recently, Mona and Hagen, together also with Philip Potin and his son here at the Institute, uh, conducted an experiment uh, with algae, and we find that up to 50% of all the carbon they secrete is in sulfated fucan. And uh, when you add the secretion capacity along the lifetime of the algae, you reach something that is on a similar order than the carbon in the algae itself. This is important to understand. When you have the algae and it secretes this sulfated fucan, along the season, we think it could be, we measure this now, that there's as much carbon in this molecule secreted as in the algae sitting there. So, and if this is true, then it means they pump it in the ocean and it's important to not collect them. Or, so, yeah, okay, I have to explain. In this discussion of using algae for carbon sequestration, they think about taking the algae that swim there and dump it into the deep. But if you dump, remove the algae, they cannot do photosynthesis anymore. They have to, I think, stay there. We need to increase, by, we have to do everything we can to help the brown and the other phylums. Like, we just have to help them and not stress them anymore. Just help them, and they are just sitting there and they're pumping out to defend themselves, uh, defend themselves against being eaten, and this is a mechanism for carbon sequestration. And they continue maybe to do it a year after year after year. They pump it out. The nice thing about sulfated fucan is, when you look at the elemental <coughs> composition, is there's no nitrogen or phosphate. It's only carbon and sulfur. Another argument against using these strategies is Okay, when they, when, we, when they dump down, uh, they move all the nutrients with them, but this molecule doesn't contain the nutrients that the algae need for growth. It contains only carbon. Theoretic, I don't know if this is true, but in a way it makes sense with everything I read so far. And you could imagine like the system here with its incredible tides. Uh, pushing in water from the Atlantic, uh, flushing around the algae, taking the tide with it again out. Uh, I don't know hydrology, maybe I oversimplify. Uh, one has to measure, talk to people, uh, modelers, and so on. But what if uh, they make this here and then it, these molecules drop down over the deep and are stable enough to move it deep. And we also found they aggregate. So it could be that this is uh, working. So what I describe here, when I extrapolate, I don't think that what I didn't show you is that there are many studies from Indian and Russian uh, people and from Chinese people who seriously show thousands, so I didn't know which one to cite. They really show it has an antibacterial effect. And nobody dares to write it's an antibiotic. I think these are all antibiotics, the secreted polysaccharides. And if this is an antibiotic made by algae, then this is just the precedent and the consequences that we live in an antibiotic world. Uh, this is a hypothesis, uh, an antibiotic world. Uh, everything around us is there to defend against pro pro prokaryotes, to constrain them so that they divide at the same speed 
uh, that we need, or uh, if we want them to divide faster, okay, but uh, the organisms in control with all the energy, all the power, are the eukaryotes, not the prokaryotes. Yeah. Um, with this, I would like to thank you. I put only one funding because it's the most significant to this presentation because you were able at that time to acquire this uh, funding to get 10 European uh, students here and I was one of them and I find this uh, fantastic and I hope that this kind of uh, thing uh, can uh, comes more. I think uh, every student deserves an experience uh, uh, like the one I had uh, to come here and to do this. And uh, I would also like to really like to thank you for taking me in. Thank you very much, Jan. So, um, time for question. So thank you very much for this inspiring talk. So I'm working on microalgae, and actually I tried to make out the numbers of microalgae I needed to produce to, to compensate uh, uh, the, the use of a number of liters of, uh, of kerosene, you know, for <coughs> example. And I was wondering whether, so you, you, you see that human um, export of, of carbon ha is so high, D do you think uh, any photosynthetic organism can keep up with this export. You know, do you have numbers where you, you try to see, okay, so if you want this organism to take up that many uh, export of CO2, what would you need to do in terms of surface or uh, ha have you tried to, to put numbers on, on this? I, I did not understand your question uh, well enough. Well, uh, you, you say that the, the solution to, um, to, to, um, uh, to, stock, to stock carbon is uh, the photosynthetic organism. Yeah, okay. And so, I, I, so and, and you make a very good point about, you know, this non, uh, this, this carbon export that is not used and not breathed by bacteria. And I wanted to know if you had a, an idea of the, of the, the quantity of, of fucus, for example, you would, you would need to export a, s a certain amount of, to, to stock, to, to get a certain amount of CO2 out of the, the, uh, the atmosphere. So, so you've got numbers on that, and if you think. So uh, I, I, think, yeah. I, I understand your question now. So can this be significant in comparison to what we emit at this moment and what is already there? Can this really help? Uh, it needs to stop now with the carbon dioxide emissions. Like this is obvious. Like uh, the emissions have to stop. Otherwise, we just have to help them. Like uh, I don't know. I think this sequestration naturally happens in the Earth system since a long, of long time. Uh, such an arms race would explain why there is coal under certain conditions uh, forming or oils. Uh, why it's not rapidly respired. Uh, I just think. Uh, I also, I mean, at least one can try to help. Like, what the worst case, they protect all each other, maybe, all these algae. Well, the worst case is nature becomes more clean. Like, uh, I think they clean the ocean with this, uh, this kind of precipitation removes all of the, all of the, Maybe a lot of the cells. Maybe that's why the ocean is blue. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, so I don't know the numbers precisely. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Another question, Konovo? Uh, I just have a question uh, regarding the terrestrial system. Yeah, no, um, so, because uh, Samuel Abiven was here, you know, he's a uh, director of Ecotron, and he told us about the story of black carbon in the, in the, in the soil, which lasts for, which really explain, you know, they, the, 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 the history of uh, the duration of carbon in, in terrestrial systems. It's really black carbon. 
And I was wondering first if, if there is black carbon also in, is, is something known in the ocean? Uh, you know, uh, and also the question is how about, uh, can you re-explain a bit the, the fact that it's sulfated in the ocean and not on, on terrestrial systems? So uh, black carbon is also in the ocean. Um, the amount is uh, much smaller than what is in what we think is a plant or algae derived glycan. So the amount of glycan in the ocean with a radiocarbon age young enough to be explained by photosynthesis is on the order of 100 to 200 gigatons. Uh, almost a third of all the carbon in the ocean in organics, uh, a third of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I know these uh, numbers are a little bit stressful because they are hard to grasp and uh, also uncertain, but there's a lot. Uh, the amount of black carbon is uh, minuscule in comparison to this. This is uh, what, I, what I know from the work of Thorsten Dittmar, who studies uh, black carbon. Uh, I do not uh, look at that. Thank you, Jan-Hendrik. So let's...